The USS Constitution was one of six ships ordered by President George Washington in the 1790s to protect America's growing maritime interests. Our maritime interests of the 21st century are decidedly different than those from 200 years ago. The blue frontier has become an increasingly crowded space. Fishing grounds, shipping lanes, Navy training ranges, energy production, food production, fish and wildlife habitats, and other interests are increasingly in conflict with each other. And in the absence of a rational planning process, those conflicts increasingly obstruct the viability of coastal economies. A Wild West land rush mentality. A number of major projects had proposed to locate in Massachusetts waters, including a couple of offshore LNG terminals. Cape Wind was, uh, was being proposed at the time. There were a couple of desalinization facilities proposed. There was another uh, landside LNG terminal. And then associated infrastructure with both of those, cables, pipelines, that sort of thing. Those were new for us. We had never seen those. And, and within the span of a couple of years, we were seeing a lot of interest in this type of activity, particularly from the energy side of things. A lot of these projects, when they wanted to get their permits, they put in an application, but there was no real framework for permitting a project like that out in the ocean. The state really didn't have any sort of zoning or planning or process by which they'd evaluate that and who owns it and why should one facility be able to build there, but then another one couldn't. After a couple of very large projects, there was a real outcry for a rational process that looked at all the uses and figured out what was where, collected a lot of data, graphically put it out there, and, and set up a permitting process to deal with those projects and to do so before the next big project came along, not while we were in the midst of it. Yeah, the thought was, well, let's stop and regroup and look for the first time cumulatively at all of the resources. Let's introduce the social values and the overall environmental values into that discussion. In order to do that, we needed a lot more data. We needed a lot more um, kind of focused and comprehensive discussion among all of the stakeholders involved uh, in the, on the marine side. And they wanted to make sure that uh, whatever plan they develop in the future, they address the needs of all of the people that need to use the waters. So you, know, you can't manage it if you don't know who's out there and what they're doing. With it. New England coastal economies support more than 360,000 jobs and earn more than $8 billion in wages related to the ocean. To protect this economic force by keeping the ocean and coast viable for traditional uses, such as fisheries, shipping, tourism, and conservation, and to address our nation's fundamental need for energy independence and national security, New England, along with other regions, are now developing a planning platform for all ocean users. This effort is aided by President Obama's National Ocean Policy, which supports the state's efforts to design regional, comprehensive ocean plans that ensure the efficient use of our ocean resources now and allow us to pass them on to future generations. Governors of, of several states, as well as the president, have put forward national energy policies and guidelines. And so, depending on how that gets enacted, there will be goals at a national level for how much renewable energy we should be producing, and a certain portion of that is going to have to come from offshore areas. We look at ocean management, as, it's, it's not a simple matter, it's very complex. We have uh, representatives that attend these meetings and, and keep us informed. To the extent that we can participate as it, as it uh, applies to our industry, uh, we try to keep on top of that. From the development side, it's that sort of understanding of what that playing field is from the very beginning. That avoids then a developer having to go out and spend a lot of money to do surveys of marine waters and to understand what's going out there, only to maybe find that that's not quite the right place for their project. So that takes money and that also takes time, and both of which are very important to the development community. So having uh, marine spatial plans within the regions and then essentially knitting those together for the entire offshore area of, of, of the United States, I think is really gonna help provide the energy industry as well as others the certainty or an added level of certainty that they need to be able to make the investments. With the energy crisis, that there has to be a balance. 
and um, a give and take. And we just wanted to make sure that, again, that the our interests um, were considered in anything that was done. Developing a plan which will eventually become for everywhere on the coast that fishermen are called in right at the beginning. Sit down, maybe they can say, look it, we don't mind it. Put it over here rather than here, same wind, and you're fine. Bottom line is we're trying to seek a balance. I mean, there's all these competing uses for the ocean, and they're all valid, and there's stakeholders standing behind all of them, and we need to find a way to help them coexist. At a time of scarce resources, just by economic necessity, we need to collaborate to get things done. But it is also better, because better decisions are made with more players at the table. Around the country, regional ocean councils are now forming to develop comprehensive and resilient ocean plans that will create jobs by allowing economic developments to move ahead more quickly, while at the same time improving the health of our ocean. Now is your opportunity to get involved.